But pulling down a building every 30 to 40 years is a tremendous waste. In fact, it's nothing short of an environmental scandal. Think about it. If you were to buy a home that was designed to fall to bits after 30 years on the day you paid off your mortgage, I think you'd be very upset. And that is precisely what happens in commercial real estate. Because most people who are building these kinds of towers simply don't have the finance or the foresight to be able to plan for longer than 30 years. And that's because the people buying them can't think longer than 30 years. The people tenanting these buildings aren't interested in paying rents reflecting the longer term structure, costs and the rest. So it's quick up, quick down, put it up, waste 30% of the building's lifetime energy cost, pull it down, dispose of all the rubbish, recycle the little bits that you can, that's another 10% of the lifetime energy cost. So if you can extend the life of the building behind me by, de uh, by a decade, then you will have produced a very significant energy saving and an environmental benefit. Uh, and, and it, that's in every sense, not just energy, but uh, use of copper, use of steel, uh, because it's very difficult to recycle more than a certain element of the materials that you use in a building. So why are these new buildings so expensive, energy-wise, to pull down and put up? Well, the single biggest cost is perhaps cement, concrete. It costs one ton of carbon dioxide for every ton of concrete that you use. That's a lot. And because of the energy used to make the concrete in the first place, which is half a ton per ton, and then the chemical reaction produced when you mix water into the cement and, uh, and sand and, and gravel and the rest. And that's another 3.5%. And those two, those two 3.5% make the 7% of all global emissions which are coming th this year from construction. It's a reflection of the real estate boom around the world. But even concrete used in the structure behind me is an area where we can make huge energy savings. Using e-crete or polymercrete, that's uh, concrete which has added to it things like the waste ash from power stations and so on, these things can reduce the amount of energy used in a slab of concrete like that uh, by about, uh, well, 30, 40, 50, 60 or 70 percent. Well, that's a lot. And if e-crete was used around the world, it would save around 2 percent of all global energy emissions. But what we don't know is the long-term structural safety of e-crete. It's fine to use it perhaps in a, in a pavement, but what about these pillars? Pillars that will have to withstand the shocks of time, weather, temperature changes, corrosion and so on over a 30 or 40 year period. And uh, even more so when we use concrete in an absolutely critical safety, safety situation such as a, a, a huge bridge, something like that then you're going to find that planners are quite reluctant to allow people to use the new e-crete mixes. But what's this space? You're going to see a lot of innovation in building materials and the rest to try and reduce the carbon footprint of the kind of buildings like the one behind me. And of course there are lots of other ways to save energy. One of them is to use geothermal heating systems. These work like refrigeration pipes with long pipes going deep down under the soil, under the foundations of a building and it's just like the refrigeration system in your home. The pipes under the ground can get hot and you bring uh, uh, and, and you suck coldness out of your building, air conditioning. The pipes under the ground get cold and you suck the, uh, the heat from those pipes into the building to heat it in the summer. Absolutely ideal for a country like Australia that is alternately too hot and too warm for the inhabitants inside these structures with a nice period of spring and a nice period of autumn uh, but uh, otherwise energy being used to cool and to heat the same structure. So to have a system which can work in reverse is wonderful as the seasons change. And the energy costs uh, per, per month are uh, only around half the energy costs of uh, using uh, ordinary systems to cool down uh, you, uh, through the electricity from the national grid on the one hand and uh, ordinary systems to heat up using say gas or oil or coal. Uh, well, we wouldn't be using coal in a building like this, but you might be using it in a furnace in a large factory or something like that. So, it's uh, an interesting area. Geothermal has had a very high take-up in Sweden, where 70% of all new homes have it. In, uh, in Switzerland, where 30% of new homes have it. In, Aus in, in, in New Zealand, where 45% of new homes have it. And in Australia, well, almost 0% of new homes. In the UK, almost 0%. In the United States, almost 0%. And yet this technology has a payback period of only 15 years. So it's waiting to be used, 
it can produce spectacular energy savings. If you build it into the structures when you actually put the structure up, then it adds to the capital value of the project. It has a payback period of seven years anyway, as I say, so what are you waiting for? Uh, or even if it's 10 or 15 years, rather. Uh, what are you waiting for? It's not a long time. It's built into the infrastructure. It's a marginal additional cost, and uh, it's very good for the environment. Another challenge with boxed structures of steel and concrete and glass is that there's no natural ventilation and indeed in very high towers if you open windows you create a massive chimney effect so that uh, people at the bottom experience massive drafts and the people at the top who are opening the windows don't feel that much benefit. So uh, you have to close off natural ventilation and that is a tragedy especially in a beautiful city like Melbourne on a glorious day like this when the air temperature is absolutely perfect and yet in every one of the buildings all around here in every one of the buildings all around here we are seeing uh, huge amounts of energy being used to do nothing other than pump air around buildings to stop people from suffocating or from the places becoming smelly and uninhabitable. So what we could do, what could we do? Well, if we were designing lower rise buildings then it would be possible for architects to open up these spaces and save all that energy that's been poured down the drain simply blowing air around. Uh, can we do it? Well, it's difficult to do in a city area like this in Melbourne where land prices are so high. But in other parts of Australia there's plenty of land and we, we have lots of opportunity to build low rise, open courtyards, green spaces and natural ventilation so that there's a lot of the year when we don't actually have to waste huge amounts of energy doing stupid things like just pumping fresh air from outside around the place. And it's healthier for people too. There's a thing called sick building syndrome, which is where all kinds of chemicals build up inside buildings, from the carpets, from photocopying inks, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the other materials in the building, um, and that can cause headaches, uh, all kinds of, of, of challenges for people's health. But when you have natural ventilation, well, you have the great air that God gave us, and it's wonderful to breathe. So in conclusion then, there's lots of things that we can do here in Australia and in every other country of the world to green up office buildings, homes, hospitals, clinics, schools, factories and every other environment where people live. Opening up enclosed spaces, natural ventilation, putting in green roofs to reduce our roof temperature in the summer and uh, keep it warmer in the winter, uh, using geothermal, uh, uh, retuning air conditioning, all kinds of stuff that we can do all of these things have a payback period which is relatively short, they require small amounts of capital and uh, it's very good for the whole of society.